Silicon Valley. Prior to founding the Pelican Imaging, Kartik headed computational cameras at Micron Imaging. He spearheaded the design of extended depth of field imaging systems for the mobile camera market. As manager of the camera and C modeling group, Kartik's end to end simulation environment for camera systems. Architecture and module simulations has been adopted in parts of the mobile imaging ecosystem. Previously at Intel, Kartik was principally associated with investigating medical imaging and visualization between John Hopkins Medical School and the Institute of Systems Science in Singapore. His interests include image processing, computer graphics, visualization, computer architectures, and medical imaging. Kartik founded Pelican Imaging in 2008. He received his PhD in computer science from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He also holds a Master's of Science in Computer Engineering from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, as well as a BTEC with honors in Electrical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Karapur. Will you please welcome Kartik Minkatamu. Uh, 
okay, on the cell phones that you have today, going down to 1.2 and uh, probably down to 0.9, is not really sustainable from a physics point of view. Uh, your wavelength of light, visible light, uh, extends from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And that's in microns, it's about 0.7 microns. Your, your pixel size is today at 1.4 microns, going down to 0.9 microns. So you're getting right down to the point where diffraction and effects overwhelm the ability to get the light down to the photodiode on the pixel. So you can't really go down much further. And uh, not to mention the fact that if you shrink the pixels down, you're also losing light sensitivity. The pixel, while it may be sharper, is not as sensitive to light. And that's a problem. So if you look at how the camera is born in the industry, you, you know, we started up with fun, the fundamental camera architecture has not really changed in a hundred plus years. Uh, it is still the same pinhole camera that we had when cameras first came in uh, to the market uh, back in the late 19th century. So you have the black and white pinhole camera essentially, which records the intensity of light. Uh, and it averages all the wavelengths in the visible spectrum. Uh, so you, what you get is uh, you know, simply the white light that you're recording the intensity of. Uh, and as the industry evolved a little bit, uh, people figured out how to capture the color. So this now captures the intensity changes with wavelength. So you add another parameter to the parameterization. So you have x, y, and spatial coordinates of the scene that you're trying to capture along with the lambda to be able to be light. And then, of course, the color movie camera came into picture, so you're adding the time dimension as well. Uh, but if you look at most cameras today, that's really where it's stuck. Um, but there's a lot more to the scene around us than just the spatial coordinates and the wavelength of light in the visible spectrum. So, for instance, if you were to color the region in space with multiple cameras, uh, then you could potentially capture the scene from different points of view, and then you have an additional parameterization, which is the coordinates of the viewing position of the camera, because that's also changing depending on where you capture the image from. So if you look at the idealized, if you have the luxury of having an idealized movie, holographic movie camera, then you would be able to reconstruct from every possible view, um, at every moment, and every position, at every uh, wavelength within the bounds of the certain region uh, that you're considering in terms of space time and wavelength. But that's, that's really a lot of information. Um, in contrast, the camera of today is capturing but a small portion of this information around us. It is capturing the two dimensional slice of this multi dimensional universe that we are living in. So it's fairly limited, and I think. Uh, the question that has to be asked is, uh, are we leaving something on the table? Uh, is there ways by which we can improve the uh, consumer experience in ways uh, that go beyond what we are doing today? So how do we evolve the camera architecture? So what is the, the right architecture for mobile uh, devices? In, in, in a sense, we, we are taking, taking an architecture that was not really meant for a small form factor device, which is the mobile phones that we carry out in our pockets today. And we are trying to shoot one, fit that uh, into, into, into that form factor. And it's, uh, we're getting to a point where it's not really scaling well. <coughs> so the question is, what else can we capture and how do we do it? Uh, Multispectral, which means you can go beyond the visible. Uh, but if you did, what does it give you? How does it improve the overall experience? Uh, we see in 3D, we see depth. Uh, we have two eyes. It gives you the ability to triangulate and assess the depth of the scene around us. Uh, but we are still stuck in a 2D world as far as it is concerned. And then, what is, what is the impact on consumers that we must consider? You know, you obviously need a uh, good resolution, but beyond the resolution aspect, uh, the color gamut, you know, how good is the color? So, for example, if you were to take a picture of your cell phone, in this uh, limited uh, lighting environment, uh, most of the photographs you would get would be fairly noisy, and the colors would actually be quite uh, desaturated, which they do, do on purpose, because if they're trying to capture the color quality at this light level, you are going to be amplifying the noise, which is noisy enough as it is. 
And then, of course, there is, uh, there is value in 3D. We'll go into it a little while. And uh, low light is clearly an area that cell phones still have a lot to do. So, what I'm going to show you is an architecture that can address all of these problems uh, and uh, help us improve some of the, uh, the limitations that we have today. Uh, and in a very small form factor, it allows you to scale very well on a limited form factor device. So, what we do is, uh, we are saying that rather than have a single large lens, you divide up the available space into a number of smaller lenses. And so you have a multi aperture system. And you, you ensure that each camera down in the array has, uh, uh, is optically isolated from the other camera. So that gives you, it gives you some advantages, as you'll see in a while. So in this, uh, in this picture, that you can see that if you have so objects, depending on where the object is in front of the camera, depending on the distance that the object is, uh, the image of this point on cam uh, the cameras in the array are displaced from the optical axis of each camera, uh, more or less depending on the distance of the object in front of the camera. So for instance, if you have an object very close to the camera, uh, the the offset from one camera, the position of one camera to the location of that same pixel in the other cameras in the array is uh, significantly larger than if the object was much further away. And this gives you, by uh, triangulation, you can actually correlate the distance uh, to the object uh, just simply uh, by determining what the offset or the disparity, as we call it, uh, between the corresponding pixels in the different cameras in the array. So depth comes naturally, uh, and there is a there is a you know corollary because our eyes are able to triangulate the depth because by virtue of the fact that you have two eyes, uh, but the array camera actually has an advantage over a two camera system in that it is much more robust in the presence of noise. In a in a, in a two camera system, there is uh, when you're trying to match pixels in one camera with the other camera. In low light situations, because of the noise, uh, the match is not is prone to errors. Uh, with multiple cameras, the more cameras you have, uh, you have the advantage of uh, having a certain amount of robustness. Um, now the cameras are all optically isolated, which means that you can now sense the different colors of light. So you can have the red, green, or blue, which are the primary colors that which you, which you sense on uh, But you can also go beyond that. You can go into the near IR spectrum, and there are some benefits to doing that even in the consumer space. Uh, unlike in the legacy cameras, where excuse me, uh, you you have an IR cut filter that filters out all the infrared component, so you want to sense only the visible light. There is uh, the the problem that if you were to allow the uh, near infrared into the uh, sensing device you will end up corrupting the color in the process. By optically isolating the different spectra, uh, we have a chance to ensure that that corruption doesn't happen, and that yet have certain advantages by sampling beyond the visible. And finally, of course, uh, these cameras are all independently controllable, which means that I can change the exposure of these cameras, as well as the, uh, the trigger times of these cameras. And this has some benefits in that you can capture kind of untrained information, or for instance, enable high speed video by triggering these cameras at slightly different phases in time. So, so here's an exploded view of the camera system that we built as a reference camera. And uh, it consists of a lens housing to protect the lens array, a spacer that separates the lens from the sensor the cover glass that is typically used is to protect the sensor from contaminants and the whole assembly is mounted on a PCB and uh, you have a fairly thin device. You'll notice here that there was no uh, order of actuators for our focus which is present in most of the cameras today. The reason is, uh, given the fact that you are now taking uh, the, the conventional optics and dividing them into a much smaller uh, optical aperture, and the corresponding focal length is also reduced, 
Uh, these together have the effect of pulling in the near focus substantially to the point that what you capture is all in focus to start with. So there is, as a result, you don't really need to have a need for an actuator, which, which is another benefit. You don't have the, the problem of an autofocus lag. Uh, we have all experienced a situation where you try to capture something quickly and you find that the moment has passed because the autofocus has been set. So there are several things that have to happen, of course, for all of this to uh, become a reality. And one of that is really the optics. Uh, the technology to do optics arrays has really come a long ways in the last decade. Uh, in that uh, there are technologies that allow you to fabricate the optics as arrays on a wafer, much like silicon chips. Uh, they use a glass substrate, much like you, what you see here. And they fabricate the polymer surfaces on either side of the glass substrate to fashion a lens element. And they can stack multiple of these glass substrates one on top of the other, and then you dice the arrays uh, uh, in one shot. So this uh, gives you an exploded view of the lens stack, uh, where you can have multiple uh, glass sub substrate, substrate elements separated by spacers, and you can even have uh, an aperture, for example, that allows you to control how much light it has the uh, optical uh, uh, step. So, the, the question that comes to mind immediately is if you're going to reduce the amount, the size of the optics uh, in terms of the aperture size, then uh, it's fairly intuitive to notice that the amount of information that you're trying to capture with that optics is much reduced. And while resolution uh, is not the only thing that's important. Uh, it is clearly important from a consumer point of view. But the question becomes, when you're trying to, when you end up reducing or downsampling the resolution by using a smaller optics, how do you get that resolution back? Now, if you look at this picture, the, the optics really is defined by the f number of the lens and the aperture or the size of the diameter of the lens itself. The lens blur or in other words, the smallest spot size that you can capture is really fundamentally limited by the, uh, the f number of length uh, of the lens and the wavelength of light. These are the two things that uh, really control how small the, uh, the lens blur is. So you want to make a very sharp lens, you want a really low f number of lens, uh, as long as it's uh, diffraction limited. And so, together with the diameter of the lens, that gives you an idea as to how much information you can really fit in the lens. So you have a large diameter and a small f number that allows you to put, fit a lot of information through the optical channels uh, for your sensor to detect. Um, now when you reduce that to a smaller aperture lens, as you do with an array camera, because you have, you have a limited amount of space in the cell phone start with, um, you're reducing the amount, of, as long as you keep the f number the same, uh, which you can, uh, the lens blur remains the same, but because the diameter is much reduced, the amount of information that you can now fit in has been reduced significantly. And that's given, that's what the that equation it looks very complicated, but essentially that's what it says, that the smaller the f number, by which of the fact that you have a smaller lens blur, you can fit more of the information in the space. But you can actually recover a lot of the information because of aliasing. And uh, aliasing is, uh, is, is a phenomenon that people in signal processing uh, are fairly familiar with, which is uh, uh, signals that are at our set of frequency uh, end up getting erroneously sampled by the fundamental limitation of the sampling process, that as a result of which the frequencies appear as a lower frequency masquerading as a lower frequency. And uh, the advantage here is, with an array camera, uh, because of the positional change of the, uh, the camera uh, in the array, uh, each of the cameras in the array actually has a slightly different aliasing pattern. And the information that is lost, supposedly, in the reduction is actually still there in the alias information, alias part of the spectrum. So by combining all these uh, information, the alias uh, information from the different cameras, you can actually recover much of the information that is hidden uh, in the process of downsampling lens. So, what you get from the ray camera is really uh, 
a set of low-resolution images, and the pipeline that is used to process these images is a little different from what you have with the conventional camera. The conventional camera has a layer filter, so you have a mosaic pattern of red, green, and blue pixels on your on your device. So what comes out of the camera is uh, an image array with red, green, and blue pixels interspersed, which are then interpolated to get the true color. So, but here you have uh, different uh, uh, low-resolution images, all from different points of view, and you have to correlate the images across each other to determine the depth, and from the depth, you can then fuse the images into a common grid to get a super-resolved image. And once you have a super-resolved image, you have the advantage that you now have a full-colored image with depth and every pixel uh, that you can process uh, in a much more uh, controlled way uh, through all the color sharpening, the sharpening and the color processing that every other camera has. Uh, and you can output a JPEG image. And you can even fold in the depth information as part of the JPEG file. So you, you maintain some amount of backward compatibility with uh, existing file formats. Now, the resolution of the uh, camera array is no different in terms of the parameters that it depends on. Uh, it is uh, still dependent, just like the regular camera, it's dependent on the optical format. Uh, that is the size of each camera in the array. The number of cameras also make a difference. Uh, the F number of the lens controls the lens blur. There is also a pixel blur that comes from the size of the pixels. So the smaller the pixels, uh, the less the pixel blur. And uh, that's actually an advantage to smaller pixels, although you lose light sensitivity. Uh, and finally, of course, there is a certain amount of improvement in resolution you get by super resolving the low resolution images. And that is the super resolution factor. Now, this image that you see points to an interesting phenomenon. Uh, when you have, when you draw uh, lines from, uh, so this, uh, this represents an array of cameras on a common plane, and you have, each camera is capturing a field of view. And when you draw lines that, cap, uh, that span the field of view of each camera, uh, you'll notice that these lines intersect at regular intervals from the camera. And those, uh, those regions, you know, for example, over here and here and here, are regions where the cameras literally fall on top of each other, which means there is no additional information that any camera, any one camera in the array has over the other cameras. And as a result, in those regions we call as null spaces, you don't really get any super resolution. You, you, you don't get much super resolution in those places. But thankfully, the manufacturing tolerances uh, are sufficient that, I mean, this is only true if you have a perfect idealized system where every camera has the same distortion as the other camera in the array. But the manufacturing tolerances, of course, prevent that. And that's one of the nice things. Uh, and so these things are kind of scrambled in the other. But even so, you can see that the more the cameras in the array, the better the sampling diversity and the better the resolution recovery overall. Let me just uh, fast forward here through uh, some of the animations. Uh, the image on the left top is an image of a high frequency pattern from one of the cameras in the array. And you can see how aliased it is. There's not really a whole lot of clarity in the signals. Um, the numbers here, 6, 8, 10, uh, tell you the number of line, line widths or line pairs uh, per, uh, per unit. In this case, line widths per picture height, or you can convert that to line pairs per millimeter. So this is 600 line pairs, uh, line widths per picture height, 800,000. Uh, this one is 500. So you can see that in this case, the low resolution image, the maximum observable frequency is somewhere in the neighborhood of about a little less than 500. It's about 480 actually. Now this blue curve represents the, the resolution contrast of the low resolution image. Now after the super resolution, you have clarity in the patterns. You have the signals have been recovered. And you now can actually observe frequencies all the way to beyond level 100. And that is refer reflected by the, the red resolution curve, which is as you can see, significantly higher than the low resolution image. In terms of the maximum observable frequency, it's about 1140, and together, you can uh, 
uh, compute that the overall increase in super resolution as a result of combining these images is about 2.4. Uh, it gives you a sense as to how much resolution you can recover through this process. Uh, in reality, we find that uh, the limit, there is a limit to how much super resolution you have. Uh, it's about two and a half, as you can see here. Uh, beyond this amount, no number of additional cameras can uh, result in any further uh, resolution increase, although it can be an advantage in terms of signal administration. Uh, here's an animation which just shows how when you throw these different cameras on a common grid, how the resolution increases uh, step by step. And uh, that's the pilot estimate, the only greens, uh, finally the super resolved color image, as you can see. Um, so now let's uh, look at a few uh, results from uh, this kind of architecture. So you have actually also, in the previous slide, if I just go back, um, the thing I want to point out is that uh, the f number of the lens that we are looking at here is f3.1 lens. It compares it an iPhone 5S or a Samsung Galaxy S4. Uh, they are typically in the range of f2.4 to f2.0, so they are much sharper lenses. Um, the pixel size, uh, which contributes to the pixel blur, is about 1.75 microns. Uh, the pixels in the latest generation of phones are about 1.4. So, uh, there is also a curve here that shows the resolution curve for the iPhone, uh, and it gives you an idea as to why the iPhone has significantly higher resolution than the uh, darker resolution from the array camera. Uh, but the, the, the fact is that the array camera has room to grow, the resolution can scale if you go to a smaller F number and a smaller pixel. Uh, there, there is no reason why uh, this can't be the same resolution as what we have in the, the conventional camera. Now, when you have... Uh, so, here's an image uh, that was taken outdoors. Uh, this is the high-resolution image with the camera array. Uh, this is the... Oh, I'm sorry. This is the uh, taken with the iPhone 5. And this is the same image taken with the camera array at the same time. Um, if you zoom into a certain region, you can actually see that the iPhone 5 is sharper as a result of a sharper lens and a smaller pixel blur. Um, interestingly, um, when you take the picture indoors, there is an interesting effect that happens that is uh, worth looking at. And that is that comes down to the depth of field. So the iPhone 5 is, because it has a much larger aperture, uh, it actually has a fairly limited depth of field. So when you take pictures at close range, uh, at the point of focus, the image is very sharp, uh, but there is defocus away from that point of focus uh, because of the limited depth of field. Um, here's the same, uh, the ray camera, uh, from the same point of view, there's a field of view difference between the two cameras, so you see a, um, the, that's a difference you see, but it's the same lighting conditions. Uh, but if you zoom into the areas, you notice that at the point of focus, the iPhone 5 is sharper than the camera ray, but as you go away from the point of focus, uh, the camera ray, because it captures everything in focus, there is no lens defocus, and it actually stays sharp all the way through. And as a result, on, on close-up shots, on portrait shots, uh, you can actually get uh, the perception is of a sharper image with the camera ray, even though it has a slower lens and a higher pixel blur than what you get with a conventional camera. Um, the process, uh, the super resolution process, and the image reconstruction process is very robust, even in the presence of noise, because you have the advantage of multiple cameras that provide a certain amount of threshold against the noise. And uh, so this is the uh, image from one of the cameras in the ring. And uh, with uh, after the reconstruction, it gives you the color image, and you can see the amount of speed up the noise, uh, especially the background with the white wall, for instance. Well, the, uh, besides the images themselves, uh, you also get uh, the depth uh, at every pixel. Now, it is a passive system, and like a lot of the depth cameras that are out there today, like what you have in the Connect, uh, which are active systems in the sense that you're actually projecting light and using the pattern uh, in front of you to compute the depth of the objects. Uh, there's no projection of light here in the camera. Uh, 
you are actually computing the depth by triangulation of the pixel disparities across the different cameras in the array. So what you get is you get very high confidence depth where there's texture. But in the regions where there's no texture, as in the flat regions, you get a lot of noise in the depth. But that noise can be filtered out, and you get a high confidence depth map that you, can, that you see here. And uh, because you have depth uh, only on the textured surfaces, uh, you, can, you can actually, by correlating the color of the pixels in the local neighborhood, you can regularize the depth to fill in the same depth regions and get a depth map similar to what you would get from the Kinect. Um, and this kind of depth is actually very useful and it's, it can support a lot of applications uh, that, uh, that are not possible otherwise. The other advantage over here is that in the case of a projected system or an active system, um, you typically have a color camera and you have an IR camera which is going to sense the IR patterns that are being projected. And these two cameras have a slightly different viewing position. So the depth that you get from the IR camera is not co-located with the color camera. And it's also a fairly low resolution. Whereas here, you can actually get the depth co-located with the color image. It allows you to capture the texture as well as the, uh, the, the, the depth coordinates without the loss of accuracy. So let's look at what, what this depth can enable us to do, uh, what are the kind of applications it supports. So we talked about uh, the fact that the camera captures a large depth of field image, and uh, you, but the fact is that you also have a depth at every pixel. So if you do want to have a synthetic focus uh, effect, uh, because it has some artistic advantages, uh, you can introduce a defocus blur selectively on different depth. So you can actually focus on the rear, or the middle, or the front, after you capture. So the advantage here, of course, is you don't suffer from autofocus lag, and uh, the picture that you capture is the picture that you want, because you get it at the instant you pick the shot. Um, so the, what, what, what else can this do? Now, one of the things that uh, is important in a number of applications, including, for instance, in video conferencing, is the ability to extract the foreground so that you can replace the foreground, uh, the background, with another background, composite it onto a different background. So there are many reasons why people want to do this, either for privacy or uh, other reasons. Um, but it's very difficult to do that. Um, it's difficult to do that because the uh, the ability to determine which are the foreground pixels and which are the background pixels uh, is just not easy. It's a very computer-intensive process. And uh, fundamentally or mathematically, the, the problem can be expressed with this equation that you see, which is really a combination of the foreground and the background pixels uh, modulated by the transparency factor, which is alpha. So what this says is that if you have a pixel that belongs only to the foreground object, uh, the alpha value for that is 1, and vice versa, which means that the pixel only belongs to the background object, the alpha value is 0. Uh, if, however, there are pixels which, have, which are partially covered by the foreground object, then this alpha value is between 0 and 1. And those are the pixels that are very difficult to determine. And we have tried, I'm sure many of you have tried doing this in Photoshop, where you have to, because, and it's a very under-constrained problem, so it requires user intervention. Uh, the user has to specify the boundary regions that they want to segment out of the image, and uh, it takes time. Now, the region of uncertainty is called a trimap, and this is the region where the alpha values are neither 0 nor 1, it's somewhere in between, which means those pixels are partially covered by the foreground object, and uh, estimating them is mathematically uh, difficult or computationally difficult problem. Uh, but once you've determined where the tri map fits, uh, because the tri map region is really a localized region around the foreground object, uh, it becomes much more tractable because the number of pixels are much smaller than the size overall size of the image. Uh, with camera arrays, there is an intrinsic uh, I'm sorry, advantage because the visibility of the 
pixels. It gives us a clue as to what this region of trimap is. Uh, this picture kind of exemplifies what we talked about, what I talked about, is that if you look at this region, there are regions in this picture. So here's a foreground object and here's a couple of background objects. And there are shaded regions around the foreground object where only one, uh, a limited number of cameras can actually see these regions. And in other words, not all cameras in the array can see these regions because they are partially included by the foreground object in front of them. And these are regions that are immediately uh, computed uh, because you have information from multiple cameras and it comes out of the depth map computation. So that gives you immediately a trimap region that can, you can then localize. The problem becomes much more uh, uh, constrained. Uh, it is not over constrained, but it's not under constrained either. And you can actually quickly come up with a solution to uh, determine or extract the foreground from the background. So you take an image uh, from the camera array. The regularized depth map is shown here. As part of this depth computation process, you are computing the trimap. And from the trimap, you can actually extract the map. And it gives you some pixel accuracy, so even small features like hair get pulled out uh, correctly. Um, now, this happens automatically. So this is a fairly uh, big advantage when it comes to uh, applications requiring image editing, for instance. So here's an actual image taken with a subject in front of a uh, texture background, uh, the map is computed and you can composite it onto a different image. Or you could uh, edit things layer, depth layer by depth layer, where you can uh, extract a map and you can then uh, composite it onto a grayscale background. You can use, you even use the same uh, background as before and convert that into a grayscale image so you have more of an artistic control of how you want the image to the pure fine. Uh, distortion correction is another important area. We are all familiar with the selfie phenomenon where we take pictures of ourselves. But the problem is, at close ranges, there's a lot of perspective distortion. The image doesn't quite reflect you because your face is distorted by the closeness of the objects to the subject. Uh, but now with the depth available, we can actually correct for those distortions. And that has a much more, uh, the consumer experience or the user experience is much improved. So this is the image without the distortion, I mean with the distortion as you capture it. And once you correct for distortion, this is actually the true image. So you can envision a potential video conferencing system uh, that, that might become available it enables real-time background substitution to enhance privacy, uh, perspective correction for facial distortion, and the third one is gaze correction because uh, this is particularly annoying for people who have been doing Skype videos or any kind of video on, the, on your laptops where the camera is located on the top of the bezel, you're looking at the window where your, the person you're communicating with is, uh, and the person who's looking at you is, uh, gets a feeling that you're looking somewhere else. Uh, it's a very disconcerting feeling uh, that can be fixed with the availability of the depth. Um, so I wanted to quickly uh, show some of the differences between the depth that you get from the kind of passive systems such as this <coughs> compared to the connect depth maps that we are familiar with now. Uh, so if you look at the uh, way depth is computed, we are computing depth not from the projected pattern, but we are computing it from correspondences across the different images in the array. And triangulation of these uh, different pixels allow you to compute that uh, reasonably accurately at those distances. And then you regularize the depth to fill in the missing regions. And uh, so this can potentially have uh, in applications in 3D scanning, for instance. Uh, you can map out the interior of the space uh, and also potentially determine uh, tech motion. So in other words, you will not, you, the camera will not be fooled by shadows moving across the scene and uh, uh, responding to that. Uh, because
because the depth of the shadows can be the disambiguating factor. So here's some images uh, taken with both the Kinect and the camera array, where you can see that um, in the case of the Kinect, one and a half meter distance, fluorescent lighting, uh, the, back, the backpack of the person actually difficult to disambiguate uh, because the uh, interesting thing is with IR uh, cameras, the reflectivity of IR cameras is not the same as the reflectivity uh, or the visible light spectra. And objects that appear one way in visible light actually appear very different in uh, near IR. And as a result of that, sometimes it can get very difficult to disambiguate between clothing. Whereas with the passive system, of course, uh, what you see is what you get. And you can actually tell clearly uh, what a person is uh, carrying. Um, as the object is seen, said farther distances out, uh, the, you can see in the case of the Kinect, the head has gotten chopped off. A uh, lot, lot, lot of the reasons for that is actually IR sometimes has a difficult time with uh, hair. The reflectivity of hair in the IR space is uh, sometimes uh, challenging. Uh, whereas in the case uh, the passive system, you still have a clear discrimination between the person and the clothing. Um, outdoors, it's a completely different issue. Uh, IR is overwhelmed with the amount of IR light that the sun has. Uh, it doesn't work, and it's the same problem with the time of flight sensors. Uh, and this really is where the passive system has the biggest advantage, because the better the light, the lower the noise, the better the light. So this is again a reflection of how the triangulation allows you to determine the uh, distance to objects. So you can see that the disparity between the pixels in the two cameras changes with the distance of the object. And that change in disparity allows you to compute the depth to a triangulation. Now, to give you a sense of how the depth accuracy changes, uh, the depth really is fundamentally determined by three factors. It's determined by the separation between the cameras and the ray, the uh, size of the pixel and the focal length of the lens. Uh, the most important factor is, of course, the distance between the cameras. So the larger the distance, you have more disparity, which means that you can actually disambiguate distances out to uh, further out, and you can get good accuracy. Um, smaller the pixels, uh, you get more depth accuracy, and larger the focal length, you get more depth accuracy for obvious reasons from the picture that we showed earlier. And so, for instance, if you had uh, cameras that are really separated uh, by 3.69 millimeters compared to 5 millimeters, uh, you can see how the depth accuracy changes from distance. For instance, at 5 meters, uh, the difference in accuracy is 30%, uh, 35% in one case, and 50% in the other case. But at close distances, uh, less than a meter, uh, it can be accurate to within which is really very good for uh, scanning. So here's a picture of a dragon that we captured at fairly close range. Um, highly tension objects, so we could actually compute, get the depth, and we imported that into a 3D viewer. Uh, these are not triangulated, this is just a point cloud, but triangulation is a fairly simple step from here. So uh, it's easy to see how this can very easily be used as a 3D scanning device. So what you have now is a camera that can be both a 2D imager as well as a 3D imager and works under all conditions. The, um, the other advantage, of course, is that when you capture an image, you're capturing, six, in this case, you have 16 cameras, uh, and you have a large synthetic aperture. So you can actually, you're capturing from different points of view. And, uh, and there's a fair amount of disparity between the different points of view, as you can see. And all of this has been captured at a single shot. So when you reconstruct the high resolution image, you can reconstruct that from any point on the large synthetic aperture that allows you to give a living picture, which, can, which you can attract. It's a more natural picture that you can uh, correct uh, automatically for the distortion, change the background, and view it from slightly different points of view. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about low light imaging, and we talked about <coughs> if you want to extend the sound thing to beyond the visible light uh, and to go into the near IR part of the spectrum, uh, what, what is it giving? What are the advantages? It turns out that there is actually a lot of signal um, in the near IR part of the spectrum that we are not utilizing today. And that can actually be very useful in some ways. So if you look at this image that was captured, now this part, this, uh, the graph from 400 all the way to 650, is the part of the light that we actually see. Beyond 650, uh, the eye can actually probably see to about 700. But 650 is the range at which all the cameras cut off. And beyond 650, there is actually a fair amount of signal, as you can see by the intensity of the signal that uh, the graph shows, or the picture shows, uh, that, that is simply not used by the cameras today. Uh, and the reason is that if they did let that signal in, because the eye doesn't see that signal, uh, allowing it in and capturing it and making it a part of the picture would actually corrupt the color, so you would actually see a false color image, which uh, doesn't really lend itself to consumer viewing. So the question is, what can we do to improve the, the experience in low light? It turns out that because the cameras are all optically isolated, uh, you can actually capture the near IR part of the spectrum by sensitizing to some of the cameras to near IR. And uh, that information is available so that you can selectively use that information to denoise the color image that you do create. And uh, that actually gives you a significant amount of advantage in low light situations. So, the other advantage, of course, is that because you're independently controlling the cameras in the array, uh, you can actually uh, compensate for the transmissive differences and the sensitivity differences between the different cameras for the different spectra and uh, ensure that the proper amount of light is set in. So here's an image uh, that was captured in the glass, which is uh, fairly good lighting, room lighting, if you will. So this is the image captured with just the RGB uh, part of the ring. There is no near IR involved. Uh, it's fairly good lighting, and as you can see, the recreation of the, uh, the, the region of interest that is shown below that uh, is fairly good. It's not very noisy. Uh, if you add the near IR component, uh, it's very similar, which is as it should be, because you don't want the color to be corrupted with the addition of the near IR component to the image. But it's in low light that it really comes through. Uh, here's the same image in low light, with just the RGB part of the image. Uh, and you throw in the near IR, and that's what you get. Uh, if you go back to the uh, image over here, there's not a significant difference between the image at 300 lux and the one at 20 lux. And this can be a compelling advantage uh, in, that would enable us to capture good images in low light. Uh, with an array approach that is that the industry is still struggling with as far as conventional camera goes. And you can do this without flash. You can conceivably think of flash in the near, near IR spectra, so you don't even see the flash going off to blind you, uh, what you call dot flash, for instance. Uh, here's a blown up, in a blown, in a blown up uh, part of the color like that shot. This is just the RGB part of the spectrum. And this is the RGB near IR part of the spectrum. And uh, if you notice on the previous slides, uh, the CMOS sensor actually has good sensitivity until about 1100 nanometers. And we are capturing information only until about 800 nanometers. So there's still a good data signal that we can still use to go even lower. So, um, so in the, in conclusion, uh, there are a bunch of ecosystem dependencies that uh, needs to come together, and is coming together, as we see, uh, for this to become a reality. Uh, optics are now being uh, addressed to manufacture the optics in array format. Uh, the small pixels that the commercial camera industry has been spearheading has advantages for the array camera as well, because it uses the pixel blur 
patented technologies that allow you to mount lens arrays to sensor arrays directly. The amount of computation we need to do uh, has, has been the biggest challenge. And uh, that's where uh, the industry has really been stepping it up over the last few years with the quad core and GPUs uh, to the extent that a cell phone today has uh, pretty much the same amount of compute power that a desktop had a few years ago. And that really helps. Uh, we believe depth is the next modality, and we can uh, hopefully look forward to getting depth on cell phones in the not too far future. And the combination of form factor, robustness in imaging, uh, and passive depth acquisition, we think, represents a pretty compelling situation going forward. Thank you.
So it just remains for me to thank Kazek, uh, Venkatesh, and uh, for a stimulating talk. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks.